Good morning and welcome. Welcome to the Doylestown Presbyterian Church. We begin with our hymn sing, and our first hymn is 462, 462. I love to tell the story. Six hundred forty nine, six four nine. Three fifty four, three five four. Six two eight six. Sixty six, six, six.
192, 192. Seventy three seven zero. I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. Please join me in the call to worship as printed in your bulletin. God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, things that are not, to reduce to nothing things that are, so that no one might boast in the presence of God in order that, as it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord.
seated. Isn't it true that often we praise God with our lips, but do not honor our maker with our lives? And so we take time now to offer our confession. With humble hearts, we offer the prayer printed in your bulletin, and then take a moment for silent prayer. Let us pray together. God of glory, we confess that we have not sought your face. You call us to follow Jesus but we are afraid to walk in faith. You call us to be one in Christ, but we continue to quarrel and fight. Forgive us, give us grace. As you have sent a savior to us, send us out as witnesses to show the wonder of your love in Jesus Christ our Lord. We make these confessions asking, Lord, have mercy. mercy of our Lord is from everlasting to everlasting. Friends, believe the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Since God has forgiven us in Christ, let us forgive one another. The peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Share his peace. Testament reading comes from, the, from 1 Samuel chapter 13, verses 5 through 15, which can be found on page 255 of your pew Bible. The Philistines mustered to fight with Israel, 30,000 chariots and 6,000 horsemen, and troops like the sand on the seashore in multitude. They came up and encamped at Michmash to the east of Bethaven. When the Israelites saw they were in distress, for the troops were hard pressed, the people hid themselves in caves and in holes and in rocks and in tombs and in cisterns. Some Hebrews crossed the Jordan to the land of God and Gilead. Saul was still at Gilgal and all the people followed him trembling. He waited for seven days, the time appointed by Samuel. But Samuel did not come to Gilgal, and the people began to slip away from Saul. 
So Saul said, bring the burnt offering here to me and the offerings of well-being. And he offered the burnt offering. As soon as he had finished offering the burnt offering, Samuel arrived, and Saul went out to meet him and salute him. Samuel said, what have you done? Saul replied, when I saw that the people were slipping away from me and that you did not come within the days appointed and that the Philistines were mustering at Michmash, I said, now the Philistines will come down upon me at Gilgal and I have not entreated the favor of the Lord. So I forced myself and offered the burnt offering. Samuel said to Saul, you have done foolishly. You have not kept the commandment of the Lord your God, which he commanded you. The Lord would have established your kingdom over Israel forever, but now your kingdom will not continue. The Lord has sought out a man after his own heart, and the Lord has appointed him to be ruler over his people because you have not kept what the Lord commanded you. And Samuel left and went on his way from Gilgal. The rest of the people followed Saul to join the army. They went up from Gilgal towards Gilbeah of Benjamin. The word of the Lord. Thank you. 
would like to invite the children to come and join me at the communion table this morning. And if you brought your backpack and haven't put it up here yet, bring it with you. We're going we're gonna to stay right here at the table. Why don't you come this way? If you want to put your backpack up here on the table, you, you can get it when they're through or at the end of the service. Put this back. Okay, great, great. All right, super, thank you. So good morning. Why, why do you think we've got backpacks here today? Any guesses? You don't know? What's, what's, what's happening for you this week? Do any of you starting school either this week or next? That's that's coming up soon, and so we brought backpacks as part of that. Now I see all different kinds of ones up here, and I know some of you didn't bring yours today, but we've got one here that has flowers on it. Actually, two that have flowers on it: a blue and a pink one. Um, something called PJ masks. Not heard of that one. Um, this is, what, what is this from? Monsters, Inc. And from Star Wars. And let's see what this one is. From Descendants. I'll take, I'll take your word for that. Yes. Okay. Now, <laughs> thank you, Craig. Or any of those who didn't bring a backpack can tell me what's on your backpack. Yeah, what's on your backpack? A keychain on it? Oh, wonderful. What's on yours? What? Flowers? Butterflies? What's on yours? All kinds of exciting things. Now, what kind of things do you put in your backpacks when you, when you go to school? You have a tiger, a tiger on yours? What do you put in your backpack when you go to school? So glue sticks and a binder. What else? What else goes in your backpack? Maybe, maybe your lunch. Do you carry your lunch in your backpack sometime? Or some books? Andrew. Folders are in there, right. You have gummy worms in yours. That's great. That's great. Well, now I want to show you my backpack. I don't, I don't bring a backpack with me to work, but I had this backpack that I take when I, when I go on trips. I want to show you some of the things that are, that are in my backpack. See if you can tell me why you think I have them in there. What are, what are these? Look, these are my running shoes, and sometimes after I have traveled a long way, I really need to get out and stretch a little bit. So I, I have those in there. Uh, I have this too. Do you know what this is? It's, yeah, it's, it's so this is how I carry my books and magazines and, and newspapers with me. Um, this? Camera, right. Um, so I, I use that to, did something fall off of it? Oh, thank you, thank you. And I have a little clip apparently in there too. <laughs> And then here on the back, can you tell what this is? Yeah, it, this is one of the things that's supposed to help you sleep on planes. It never works for me, but, but I still take this with me. And so, so I have my backpack, not to get me ready for school, but to get me ready for a trip when I'm going somewhere and things that I want to make sure stay with me when I'm traveling. We're, we're having this time together as a church because we want you to know that as you start school, that not only God is with you, but that we're holding you all up in prayer as well as you begin a new year of learning and discovering the things God wants you to know. So what I'd like for you to do, instead of us closing prayer together where you repeat after me, I want you to gather with me around the communion table. So stand up, stand up and gather around the communion table. 
And then I want the congregation to pull out its bulletin and to join me in offering the prayer. You come all, you come all the way around the table here. Come on. And we'll have a prayer for our backpacks and for our children, for the backpacks that aren't here and the children who aren't here too, for God's blessing as the year begins. So please join me in the prayer in our bulletins. Loving God, we gather to celebrate the beginning of a new school year. We pray for all schools that they may be lively places for learning, discovery, and the pursuit of goodness. Give students open minds and open hearts to learn. May this year be full of promise for them, their teachers, and all who shape learning that each will experience new beginnings. Bless these backpacks and the children who carry them. Give them peace when they feel nervous, focus when they feel distracted, energy when they feel tired. Be ever present in the classroom and on the school bus, on the playground and at home, that they may feel your care in all that they do. In the name of Jesus, the good teacher, we pray. Amen. Now you can either leave your backpack here until the end of the service or take it with you now. So thanks for coming up. Testament lesson comes from the Gospel of Mark from the third chapter. It recalls the moment when Jesus assembles those 12 men who represent his initial followers. You can find this passage on page 37 in the New Testament portion of your pew Bible. He went up the mountain and called to him those whom he wanted and they came to him. And he appointed twelve, whom he also named apostles, to be with him, and to be sent out to proclaim the message, and to have authority to cast out demons. So he appointed the twelve, Simon, to whom he gave the name Peter, James, son of Zebedee, and John, the brother of James, to whom he gave the name Boanerges, that is, sons of thunder and Andrew, and Philip, and Bartholomew, and Matthew, and Thomas, and James, son of Alphaeus, and Thaddeus, and Simon the Cananean, and Judas Iscariot, who betrayed him. Let us pray. We do give thanks, O God, for your living word to us, and pray that you might send your spirit in this time, that we might be strengthened in knowing of your love and equipped in new ways to serve and follow you. For it is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The story is told of a man who was actively looking for a church home. He went to one congregation and saw that there weren't many people his age, and so decided not to come back. He visited another place, but no one spoke to him while he was there, and the sermon felt especially harsh. He visited another where there seemed to be some kind of uneasiness in the room, and the congregation had a style of music that was not his pre preference. Finally, he came to another congregation on a Sunday morning. He was warmly greeted as he entered. The choir offered an anthem that inspired. The hymns were familiar to him, and the message from the pulpit 
touched his heart. And yet the deciding piece actually came at another part of the service. For it was during the prayer of confession that he, along with all who were gathered that morning, prayed these words, We have done the things we ought not to have done and have not done the things that we should have done. And even as he spoke those words, he said to himself, I've found my crowd at last. Sometimes those who are outside the church have this perception that those who are within its walls have it all together. We know differently than that. And in fact, the two biblical texts before us this morning make clear that God has always used imperfect human beings because that is all God has to work with. Our first account offers the continuing narrative that has been our focus this summer, tracing the life of Samuel, the last judge of Israel, and Saul, its first king. Two weeks ago, we recalled a moment when Saul, in one of his first tests as a new sovereign, successfully led the people in repelling a a threat from the Ammonites and how the soldiers rallied around him and confirmed him as their king once more. Today's reading tells of another moment a short time later when the force of the Philistine people has become apparent. The army of Israel is vastly outnumbered And we're told that some of them begin to hide in caves and in cisterns. Even those who stay with their king, we are told, are trembling. And Saul waits for seven days for Samuel to appear. When that period of time passes with no sign of the judge, Saul then orders that the people offer a burnt offering, a sign both intended to to express God's pleasure in them and also confess their sin. And as soon as that act is finished that we're told that after offering the burnt offering, Samuel then appeared. The king goes out and greets him, shows due deference to him. And the judge says to him, what have you done? Saul says that that the soldiers were beginning to wander away, that before he went into battle, he wanted some sign of God's presence with them, and that he had waited a whole week, and Samuel had not appeared. But the judge is unconvinced. What you have done has been foolish. For you have broken the commandment that God had given to you. God was going to make your kingdom an everlasting kingdom, but now that you have done this, God has selected another, a man after his own heart, because you have broken the commandment God gave. And with that word, Samuel leaves, and Saul heads out for battle, knowing that his successor has already been identified. This is one of those moments that can confuse us as we read about it. If, in fact, Saul had broken some clear commandment of God that had been told to him, this turn of events, while harsh and quick, would at least have been understandable. But there's a problem. Because when we look at the larger picture of Scripture, there's no moment when Saul is given a commandment that he is never to offer burnt offerings. He's never given an indication that God has been thinking about a replacement for him or that God had in mind that Saul's kingdom would reign forever. There's not even anything more than just a passing suggestion that the normal pattern was that Saul had to wait seven days before Samuel appeared before he was to act. Instead, what we are given here is a moment that sets the stage for what will be our reading next week. When David is anointed as the next king, there will be a long gap between that moment and the time the transition begins. 18 more chapters in this book of 1 Samuel where we see Saul 
de deteriorate, both as a king and as a human being. And it all began here in this moment when Samuel exclaims that Saul has broken the commandment. That's a problem to our reading. And either we're left with a text that omits key details to help us understand it, or what we have is this judge who for his own reasons is setting Saul up. I'm inclined to think it was the latter. It strikes me as more than coincidence that Samuel appears just after Saul offers that burnt offering. And we know that Samuel had not been in favor of the people having a king and had only gone along because God had insisted. And we have seen over the course of the summer that even when Samuel introduces Saul to the crowd for the first time, and then after that first moment of military victory, Samuel is quick to point out how the people have rejected God by demanding a king of their own. And that leaves me to suspect that what we have here is not a glimpse of Saul breaking some commandment, but of Samuel, for reasons that aren't explained to us fully, choosing that he wanted to get in one last word. We really don't know. We don't know either way. And yet what we do have clearly in this scene is a glimpse of two human beings who are being utilized for God's purpose. Two very ordinary people for whom events then took over. They're certainly not the last ones in Scripture who found those kinds of circumstances arising. Our New Testament reading tells us at that moment when Jesus identifies those 12 men who will compose his inner circle, those initial disciples or apostles. Mark tells us that Jesus goes up to a mountain and he calls these that he wishes to follow him. And then the gospel writer gives us editorial comments about only four of those disciples. He, he says that Jesus called Simon, who later he named Peter, that he called James and John, whom Jesus referred to as the sons of thunder, and that he called Judas, the one who would betray him. The fact that Mark offers those other details about this group lifts up a question, I think, that has often been present for believers, namely, of why was it that Jesus chose this very flawed and imperfect group of men as his initial followers? A number of years ago, someone gave me a letter that in more modern times tried to lift up that same theme, and it was addressed to Jesus, son of Joseph, carpenter shop, Nazareth, and it came from a group that called itself Jordan Management Consultants. And the letter read as follows. Dear sir, thank you for sending us the resumes of the 12 men that you're considering for man management positions in your new endeavor. Each of them have completed a battery of tests, which we have not only run through our computer, but we had opportunity for each of them to meet individually with our psychologist and our vocational consultant. And we wish to offer you some feedback. He said, it is our opinion that none, most of these men lack the background and education or the aptitude required for your venture. They are not team players. Simon Peter, they went on to said, shows signs of a volatile temper. James and John lift up their needs above corporate interests. Andrew apparently has no leadership abilities whatsoever. Thomas is prone to ask questions that can undermine team morale. James, the son of Alphaeus and Thaddeus, are both clearly radicals. And Matthew, the tax collector, we feel compelled to tell you, has been blacklisted by the better Jerusalem, the broader Jerusalem Business Bureau. 
There is, however, they said, one candidate that we think is exceptional. He shows great ingenuity and a business sense and has connections in high places. He is creative and good with finances and, and is clearly ambitious. Our recommendation is that you make Judas Iscariot your comptroller <laughs> and your right-hand man. All other details, he said, are self-explanatory. We wish you your best in your new venture. Those words make clear that we too aren't always the greatest judge of character and we'll never know why Jesus selected the 12 that he did. And yet it lifts up for me the very real dynamic that there are people like that, people like us, that compose the church still. To me, one of the greatest proofs of God's existence has always been the fact that for 2,000 years, the church has continued to serve and grow, clearly sometimes missing God's point, and sometimes in spite of itself, furthering God's purpose. Imperfect people, just like us. Frederick Buechner, Presbyterian minister and writer, lifted up that dynamic once in a very creative fashion when he compared the church to Noah's Ark. Here's what he said. In one as in the other, there is a collection of everything imaginable, clean and the unclean, the predators and the prey. There are the caddy and the piggish and the peacock proud. There are hawks and there are doves. There are those who are wise as owls and silly as geese, those who are meek as lambs and fire-breathing dragons. There are times when the group will cackle and roar and grunt, and grunt and sing, and then there are times when you can hear a pin drop. Most of them don't have a clear idea of where they are heading or what they're to do once they get there, but they have this idea that the people in charge know and that they can just then rest on their haunches and enjoy the ride. It is not always enjoyable, Beekner continues. There's backbiting like everywhere else. There's jostling at the trough. There is grumbling and grousing. There are times when the dogs get in the manger and there are old goats and black widows. It's a reg regular menagerie and sometimes it smells to high heaven. But at its worst, he concludes, the storm within, serve the storm inside, resists the one outside its walls. The wild winds, the terrible waves, the waste of water that cannot save, and at its best, there is, if never smooth sailing, protection from the storm. A sense of somehow moving in the right direction in spite of everything, a ship to keep afloat, and like a beacon in the night, the hope of finding safe harbor at last. In other words, there are creatures on that boat, like you and me, like Samuel and Saul, and those first 12 who followed Jesus. Imperfect people who have committed their lives to following a perfect Lord who calls upon us still to embody and share the good news despite all of our feeble attempts, which suggests that on this day, 
knowing that those ancestors in the faith represent us too, it is a time for us simply to say, thanks be to God. Even as we continue to bob along in zigzag fashion, seeking that safe harbor. Let us pray. We thank you, God, for the record that we have of those women and men in times past who followed you, and for the fact that we do not only have accounts of those moments when they were perfectly able to hear your word and act upon it, but instead, unblinking looks at those moments when they missed the mark. We thank you for the call that you have extended to each one of us and pray that we will draw ever closer to your will, knowing that even when we fall short, that your will might go forward. For it is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. standing to affirm our faith using these words of our denomination together we proclaim we trust in Jesus Christ fully human fully God Jesus proclaimed the reign of God preaching good news to the poor and release to the captives teaching by word and deed and blessing the church healing the sick and binding up the brokenhearted, eating with outcasts, forgiving sinners, calling all to repent and believe the gospel, unjustly condemned for blasphemy and sedition. Jesus was crucified, suffering the depths of human pain and giving his life for the sins of the world. God raised this Jesus from the dead 
vindicating his sinless life, breaking the power of sin and evil, delivering us from death to life eternal. Please be seated. At this time, please sign the friendship pad and pass it to the person next to you. A few announcements that I'd like to highlight. Uh, there is a, a place you'll see in the announcement section for you to nominate an elder or deacon. They begin service next uh, June. So that may be yourself or another person who you think would be a good leader for our church. Uh, please uh, give thought to that. Also in two weeks, we kick off with our, our homecoming. We have a breakfast at 8.30, then one service at 9.30. Uh, you'll see more about that on, this on page six. Now we're, we're uh, sending out cards to a lot of uh, people in the area. So we anticipate that we'll have guests that morning. Be on your best behavior. <laughs> and um, it'll be a, a great celebration to come back as fall begins and uh, hopefully we'll have a number of visitors with us. You may be experiencing loneliness or a need for meals or a variety of, of challenges, and DPC Cares is an important ministry of our deacons. In addition to that, there's Stephen's ministry, which is a little bit more uh, of a regular ministry, uh, a weekly or two or three times a month, a visit from a person, a person who has been trained as a Stevens minister. So if you yourself or, or you know of someone who needs a deacon or a Stevens minister, uh, please contact any of the deacons uh, or any of the pastors. This morning we celebrate someone who is very special in the life of our community. John? I'd like to invite Naomi Darville to come and join me at the communion table. Good morning. Uh, Naomi concludes her service later this week as our hospitality coordinator. She has filled this role since 2003. Uh, but actually, it goes back even further than that. I think off and on since 1982, for 37 years, she has been sharing in the hospitality ministry of our church and has done so in a variety of visible ways when there have been receptions, say, for Celebrate the Arts or following a wedding or a funeral, providing meals for our officers elect during a time of training, uh, and support for our need uh, and regular occurrence of our sacred grounds, times of fellowship. Naomi has done all that work, sometimes out front, many times behind the scenes. I, I think it's probably an underestimate on my part that over those years, she's used about a mile's worth of that labeling tape, too. <laughs> Which, which, which means that as you go into the kitchens, you will see all these really very clear signs and instructions about how to make coffee and, and where you can find the materials that you need. And that has also been part of what Naomi has done for us. Naomi has been a member of our congregation for 53 years. Joined at age five, is that yes, right? Yes, yes. And, and, <laughs> And, and, and that ministry, of course, will continue following this time. Uh, but we couldn't let this moment pass without celebrating Naomi's ministry to us. There will be a reception that follows the service today uh, out in front, um, where Naomi had no involvement in that reception. And so <laughs> would encourage you to come and share in that time with us. Um, as you make this change, too, uh, you're moving to a time when your hospitality will be a little more private. Okay. Uh, and so we have, we have a couple of gifts for you to help in that regard. Um, and we share with you these verses from Scripture that I think uh, from Paul's letter to the Colossians where he said, whatever your task, put yourself into it as done for the Lord and not for your masters, since you know that from the Lord you will receive the inheritance of your reward. You serve the Lord Christ. Naomi, we thank you.
this would be possible without the folks that are sitting over there, my dear family. And none of this would be possible without you, my church family. Bless you all, and thank you so much. <laughs> Please join us after the service today, too. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any prayer concerns or celebrations that you have this morning? We'll certainly be praying for the people in Texas. Marv? Uh, that's exactly what I was going to ask. Pray for the people in Texas who are suffering. I have relatives there and friends, and I, I just placed three calls this morning on two, oh, one who has been treated. So they were going to get together. Yes. Okay. Prayers for Texas. Any other? Celebrations or concerns? Keith, uh, we're just a few weeks away from our church school, um, beginning of church school, and uh, the CE committee is still in need of volunteers or teachers to help our children uh, learn the faith. And we're just putting that out there to ask those of you who consider that to help in our team teaching role, which is a team teaching model, which is a new model this year. So looking for church school teachers. Thank you, Tony. Any others? John? Thank you. Yes. Um, pray me for my fish. For your fish? Yeah. Oh, that's great. Oh, how cool. Is it a new fish? Yeah. Yes. All right, we'll pray for your fish. Let us bow our heads then in prayer. O oh God, the Creator, you are the depth of all that is. You are the ground of our being. We can never grasp you, yet you grasp us. And your love comes to us in Jesus. God the Son, you are the perfection of humanity. You have shown us what life should be like. In you we see divine love and human greatness joined as one. God the Spirit, you draw us to Jesus. You are the power within us, comforting and convicting us. Father, Son, Spirit, God beyond, beside, and around us, we want to worship you and marvel at your mercy. We pause now to wonder over your delight your delight in color, in diversity. For you have created us white and black and brown. We speak so many languages, Chinese, Portuguese, Swahili, and English. We are citified and countryfied and just village people. We are men and women, rich and poor, complex and simple, educated and untutored, and you, love us all. We are thrilled by life, and sometimes, Lord, we admit that we are bored to death. And so we come to you. We come in weakness to find strength. We come in sickness to find wholeness. We come in chains to find freedom. We come in sorrow to find joy. We come in doubt to find faith. We come alone to find community. Direct us. 
Open us to your Spirit. Kindle in us a passion to follow your Son, our Savior. And instill in us discernment to see what is right, faith to believe what is right, and courage to do what is right. We pray in thanksgiving for a new fish. We pray in thankfulness for all the pets in our lives who bring us joy. We pray for the people drenched by rain in Texas. O Lord, strengthen those who are overwhelmed by wind and water. Be near to these people who are flooded by despair. Lift these people in their communities. We pray for more church school teachers. We pray for missionaries. We pray for all who struggle to discern your will and to trust in your amazing grace. O oh Lord, hear us now as we lift you others we know in need of hope from your Son. And finally, we thank you for dear Naomi, and we wish her well as this new chapter begins in her life. Thank you for her faithfulness to you, her deep faithfulness to this church, and the quiet ways in which she has served, has organized us, and kept us faithful in sharing your love and in being kind, welcoming, hospitable people. O oh Lord, we praise you. We praise you for the new life you give us through Jesus. We praise you for this church. And we praise you for your Son, the one who has taught us now to pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, in heaven as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. We continue to worship God as we bring forward these gifts in our lives.
Please join me in prayer. God of love, God of grace, we bring our offerings of treasure, time, and talent. Our prayer today is that you use these monetary gifts and us, even people like us, flawed and imperfect as we are, to do your will and your work in this world. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Go now in joy, knowing that God has equipped you for the very gifts needed for the world that waits outside these walls. Go forth knowing that we are not perfect, and yet still God has entrusted to each one of us this good news. So claim it, accept your part in it as you continue to share it with a world desperately in need of its message. And as you do, May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you and sustain you on this day and forevermore. Amen. Amen.